1 Peter chapter 3, we will be looking at verses 1 through 6. Now, I had planned on looking at verse 7 also, because verse 7 deals with husbands. And I thought, well, let me squeeze that in there. But then I thought, no, uh, I want to spend more time with the husbands too, and not just with the wives, because we have a whole service today that we'll be speaking to you ladies here concerning your husbands or unbelieving husbands. And I didn't want to seem unfair. Oh, boy, he spent a whole service with us on, on wives, and then all of a sudden, at the end, he throws a few words about husbands. You know, that's not fair. And so I'm going to spend a whole service next week, and we'll talk about husbands in one verse, and we'll really, <coughs> we'll really attack you guys and your responsibilities. But this morning, we're going to talk about submission, that wives should have under their unbelieving husbands and believing husbands. Not a friendly topic. I understand that. Not a friendly topic. Uh, it, the word submission uh, is piercing even to some people. Um, but when you know God, again, as I said earlier, when you know God and God has your best interests, He wants you to flourish in your relationships. He, he wants you to grow He wants you to really find peace and rest in His truth. When you know that, it just falls into place. It makes sense. God's whole plan of women submitting to their their husbands. See, the Scriptures have to have the last say in our lives. They have to. We don't serve a God that has saved us and then says, okay, now go and Try to live your life the best you can. You know, hopefully you do pretty good. You know, I'll just kind of watch you and see what happens. Well, we've tried that, right? We've tried that. And we're not doing very well doing it that way. In fact, it's sad to say that the church has more divorce rate than the world. So the church isn't doing very well with it either. See, God has written this word right here for us. This is his scripture. As I mentioned, Paul wrote in Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. (coughs) God gave the words to Peter to write down for us. So that, whether it's profit for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness... That a man of God, a woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the good work is, is your husband as a woman supporting and honoring and respecting him and submitting to him. So, Scripture has the last say. We have to live that way as believers. And unfortunately, we don't. We go to magazines, we go to books, we go to other things besides what does Scripture say? What does the Bible tell me how I ought to act? What does the Bible say I should do? That's important because what the Bible says is what God is saying to us. Don't even listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what God is saying. And if you are a believer, as Jesus said, that if you become a believer, then a believer has fruit and you judge them by their fruit, right? They will have fruit. Well, what is fruit for a believer? Is that they're obedient to the word of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you follow my commandments. And so the implication there is that if you're not following his commandments, then you're not loving God. And that's truth. As harsh as it is, it's truth. We want to follow God's commandments. Why? Because they're good for us. As as Paul said, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable. So understand that these words are profitable for us as women and as men. To grow in the Lord. So as we continue on through Peter here, God wants to bless you in your relationship. The real issue, John Corson said, the real issue is not knowing what to do, but it's doing what you know to do. It really is. We know the truth. We know that we are to submit as wives to our husbands. Now, the issue is, how do I do that? How do I do that? And Peter explains how we do that. Let me give you some cultural context here before we continue on. During this time that Peter is living and teaching to the early church, it was a time of prosperity. 
<clears throat> they were very wealthy. The Roman Empire was growing. It was expanding. It was taking over the whole world. And so they had enough resources to import many, many riches, many wealth. Uh, they had pearls. They had gold. They had diamonds. Uh, one of the favorite colors back then was purple, and they would import purple and dye all their, their clothing. The women would love to dress up. They, they would wear their hair in a kind of pompous type of thing and put diamonds and, and add extensions to it. Just kind of like today. We, we do the same thing today. And they would uh, puff it up and put perfumes. And, and they were so concerned over their hair. Their hair was a big issue back then. That they would, they would hardly sleep because they messed their hair up you know, while they're sleeping and so forth because they took so much time. And nobody could touch their hair because they would have the diamonds in there and all the little uh, trinkets and stuff and gold chains and things upon their hair and on their bodies. And so it was a time of wealth. <coughs> and so Peter's going to take from that <clears throat> and he is going to let women know they're nearly church not to put too much weight in those things. Don't depend on them. <clears throat> it's okay to beautify yourself. It's okay to adorn yourself. But don't go to the extreme. And don't think because of your adornment that God is going to use that to save your unbelieving husband. Because God doesn't work that way. And so your adornment is to please your husband, but your adornment is not to be done to get your way, to manipulate and so forth. So Peter's going to explain that. Also, as we've been going through this, we've been talking about authority, God's ordination over authority, his authority in government, and how we as believers are to submit unto the government. Also, employers, as employees, if you want to advance then be a faithful employee. Work hard. And when your employer sees that, you will advance because God promises that. He's faithful to keep his promises. And then submission to, to husbands. A husband has the authority. We can find that and it will see that in chapter or verse 7 next week, but also Colossians 3.18, Ephesians 5.22. He has authority as the head of the home. Um, we'll talk about that next week. And that authority is to be used properly. And then parents also have authority over their children. That's a tough one. Parents having authority over their children. Um, I've been blessed and by God's grace to raise my children from a young age all the way to adulthood. And now seeing my grandchildren and, and having input in their lives today. So I've experienced all that. The authority of a parent, of elders within the church. There's authority of pastors and assistant pastors and elders and deacons within the church itself. Uh, not popular, another teaching of, uh, uh, submission unto the church. Not very popular either. Um, it's rare that you get people within the church that are submissive to uh, the authority of that church. Because we live in America and we have the freedom to do what we want. Um, we can go eat at one place or another or we can go fast food in and out and so forth. And so we view church that way. We don't commit ourselves to the authority there. We don't commit ourselves in a relationship with the body of Christ. We commit ourselves to the place to be there, but that's as, as far as it goes. We don't commit ourselves to, to the leadership and putting ourselves under their authority. There was a situation... Um, where this young man uh, was struggling with his pastor and uh, he asked me for some prayer at a pastor's meeting and then um, the last time I saw him, I asked him, how's it going? And he says, man, God really had to, really had to teach me submission to my leadership. I put myself under them. Uh, I learned, uh, I submitted, and wow, it's, it's amazing how the load is just lifted off of you. And, and here I am still. And they learn that. And that's a difficult thing to learn within the church because it's so easy to say, I don't like that, let's go to another church. It is easy to do that. And I understand that. And you have the right to do that. But you will never understand or learn the submission to those that are in the body of Christ. Ultimately, when we get to heaven, guess what? We're all going to be submitted to the Lord. Because ultimately, he has the, the ultimate authority over all. So, he gives us opportunities to learn that today for our, for our good. Some examples of submission. Jesus submitted to his parents. We see that in Luke 
2.51. Demons submitted to the disciples. We saw that when Jesus sent them out two by two, that even the demons were subject unto us. The universe will be subject unto Jesus. We see that in Corinthians 15.27, Ephesians 1.22. God holds everything in its place. The unspiritual beings, the, the demonic forces, uh, the angels are all submitted to Jesus Christ. Christians should submit to their church leaders. 1 Corinthians 16, 15 and 16. 1 Peter 5, 5. We'll get to that. Wives should submit to husbands. Colossians 3, 18. Titus 2, 5. Titus 2, 1. Peter 3, 5. And Ephesians 5, 22. Now, why does, why are there so many references to that compared to other submissions? That's strange. I find that interesting. The church is to submit to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 24. Christians should submit to God. Hebrews 12, 9 and James 4, 7. Now, why mention all those, Pastor Reuben? Well, I'm mentioning them so that you understand submission is a vital part of our lives. We are submitted to someone, whether it's our employer or government or church leadership. We are to be submissive uh, to those authority for our benefit. And so I want you to see that submission is, is active in our life. Now, why so much on women? And we'll talk about that in a minute. There's a purpose for that. And, and it's not necessarily um, that bad on you and so you get punished but in a, in a in a sense it's because it's such a struggle to be submissive because of the fall of man so let's go ahead and read the verses and then we'll get into um, the six verses let's start in verse one likewise you wives be submissive to your own husbands that even if some uh, do not obey the word they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your beauty be the outward adorning or arranging of hair or of gold or putting on fine apparel, but let it be of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible ointment of the gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husband. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And so there's the context. Peter gives us the instruction, and then he also gives us an example from the Old Testament on how Sarah submitted to her husband. And so let's get into this as wives are to be submissive to their unbelieving husband. Now in context, the whole purpose of, of wives submitting to their unbelieving husbands is that they would come to the Lord and know the Lord. That's the whole purpose. So you might be saying, oh, so it doesn't apply to me because my husband believes. So I don't have to be submissive. No, he gives us the example of Abraham. And guess what? Abraham was a believer. And Sarah still submitted even unto Abraham. So within the context, it is for us to submit, ladies. I apologize for that. But God has a purpose in all of that. Now, I hope that the Spirit of God moves in your heart to see the heart of God in this. And I hope you don't see, see, see me up here. Um, don't look at me. Look at what God is saying in His Word. And I'm saying all this stuff because I want you to understand it's His Word. And it's His truth. And it has to come into your heart and move you. Uh, and the only way for that to happen is for you to understand that it's coming from God. And God has a purpose in it all. If you view the Word in this manner, let me find a place where there might be a discrepancy and I don't have to submit. Then you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. Because you're looking for the air, you're looking for the rationalization to not do it. You have to be willing to say, Lord, I want your will to be done. When I counsel people, this is something I learned years ago, because I know people, when you counsel couples, I know that they each have their own side of the story. And it's going to be different. It's just going to be different because it's their perspective. A lot of times there's miscommunication. And they may thought they heard some things, and they may have, but then the other say, no, that's not what I said, but it was what they said, but not what they meant. And it all kind of works together, so it's hard to kind of, 
it's like a knot. You ever get a knot of things and you're trying to unravel the knot and pulling it all out so you can straighten everything out. Very difficult to do. And I, I have just learned that because we say things, but that's not what we intend tend to, to mean. But we don't know how to use the words, so we, we use what we think it's, it is coming across, but it's not coming across. Like I'm right now trying to make you understand what I'm saying. And it's hard for me to get that across to you. And so I've learned that when you counsel people, you always, at least I do, I counsel them. What is your responsibility? Because oftentimes they're coming in here and saying, they do this, they do that, they don't do this, they don't, okay. Well, what is your responsibility? What are you supposed to do? Yeah, but that's not fair. Well, what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to act? You know, don't start pointing fingers. You be the person God wants you to be. You know, you act the way God wants you to act. And then watch what happens. And so I usually counsel that way because I don't know what the other person says. I wasn't there. You know, and they could be saying that. And and you have to kind of address that a little bit. Well, if they said that, and I often say that too, if they said that, that wasn't appropriate. But still, how do you act in light of that? You forgive, you let it go, you forget it, and you need to move on. You know, those type of things. And so um, it's difficult. In those relationships. But we know that when God deals with us, that we need to be true to the word. And so here Peter tells us, wives, likewise, uses the word likewise as he did in the past. Likewise, in other words, he's going back to the previous chapter. And he's saying, like we are to submit to government, like you're to submit to your employer. And then he gave us the example of Jesus Christ submitting to the cross. So likewise, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, he said, your own husbands. And that word submission is the same word as the others. It's just putting yourself under your husband. Now, submissiveness is not a spineless submission. It's not spineless. You you are not a spineless person. You still have opinions. You still have information that you can give in your relationship to your husband that can be vital for both of you. My wife is so much smarter than I am in a lot of areas. And I depend on that smartness because I'm not smart in those areas. To give you a little bit of a background, I grew up in, in the impoverished area of Roland Heights, right there by La Puente and the railroad tracks. Virginia grew up in the suburbs of Roland Heights in the hills with big homes and stuff like that. Her father was an engineer. You know, her her aunts and uncles are doctors and lawyers. I mean, she's just educated individual and I wasn't, you know, so now you put those two together and boy, what a battle you've got, you know, because I was more geared on my emotions and how I live, my macho pride and all those type of things, you know, where she could reason through things. And she taught me a lot as a young person. I met my wife at the age of 13, for those of you who don't know. And so uh, she got pregnant at 16 and we had our firstborn son. And I learned a lot from her and her family because they were very educated people and it moved me to better myself and so forth. So so don't discount, now I'm talking to husbands, don't discount your wife. Your wives have a lot to say. And, and it's not a spineless position. Um, it's an act of the will. It really is an act of will. It's an act of selflessness, saying I am submitting your, myself unto my husband. I've read a lot of books on this. I've seen a lot of steps, you know, in your letter you, you have there, I think it's 10 steps on being the, the wife that you need to be. Uh, the purpose of that is written by a woman. And I read this all, the, I read these things all the time. These, these women will write these things on how they submit to their husbands. And there are many Christian women out there that submit to their husbands. They understand the biblical principle of it all. And they understand that there's a, there's a release or a release of burden on them because they're not responsible. Their husbands are. And so they can put their two cents in. Oh, let's just say 99 cents in, you know, and then leave it with them and know that God's going to hold them that's responsible for the final decision. And then you see the articles written by men and they will they will say how the wives to be submissive but yet I'm to love them and so boy I've got to approach God on this prayerfully and lead my family in, in the best way possible doesn't always happen that way you know 
my wife, because we grew up in such a uh, different family, diverse and so forth, um, I was very aggressive, macho, prideful, authoritative and so forth and and where she just loved me so much as a as a young girl not understanding knowing all that she was just very submissive whatever i wanted to do this what we did you know and i had to learn once i became a christian and it was hard to get rid now i'm talking to husbands again am i so i want to really get on you guys i had to learn and it was very difficult for me to learn to lead my wife you know because what can happen as a man is that you become so stubborn and so bullheaded in a sense that that your wife will rebel against that and that's not what you want you want them to willingly give their hearts to you in submission but it means that you have to lead as Christ led the church but back to women again so it's not a spineless uh, position or a place it, it's it is a submission which is based on death to pride death to pride on on one hand there's a desire to serve others but yet you have to serve yourself less in that area of submitting to your husbands um turn to genesis chapter three i just want to i want to show you this and where it came from because i think it's important (laughs) see this desire to that women struggle with of submission is a part of the fall of man. When we look at the result of Eve's usurping her authority over Adam as a leader, and we see what happened with that, right? We all understand that story, right? We've all read it. You know, God told Adam not to eat of the fruit, and here comes Eve, and she eats of the fruit and says, Hey, take some honey, and he does it, you know. She usurped her authority over Adam. And Adam, instead of saying, look, God told us not to do this. Why are you giving me this fruit? Why did you eat of this fruit? If we were to be obedient to God, none of this would have happened. And so forth. So, But Adam kind of crawled up and said, okay, honey, I'll, I'll eat it if that's what you want me to do. And, and boom, here we are today with sin. Well, the result of that is, is that part of the punishment for the women is that the women will desire to rule their husbands. There's a desire embedded in you because of the fall. Look at Genesis 3, 16. It says, To the woman he said, this is God speaking, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. So this is all part of the the, the repercussion of the fall. Uh, Apparently birth wasn't painful at one time. But because of sin, now birth is painful as a reminder and it is is for women. Paul, uh, Paul talks about it later on uh, that women are reminded of their fall, and it's through birth. So when that pain happens, you're like oh, I got the pain. I remember why. It's because the women had fallen in the earlier uh, part of creation. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now that verse right there. Your desire shall be for your husband. And he will rule over you. It's talking about submission. Your desire, it's not saying your desire will be to, to submit yourself to your husband, but he's gonna rule over you. No, this word desire is talking more about control. Rule. Turn to chapter 4 and look at verse 7. It's the same word that's used here. In verse 7 it says, if you do well, Will you not be accepted? Now, this this is the sin of uh, Cain and Abel. And we know what happened there and how Cain slayed his brother Abel because of his hard heart. And so God is speaking again to him, to Cain, and says, If you do well, you will be accepted. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you shall Or you should rule over it. You should, but you shall rule over it. So, what's sin's desire? It's desires for you, but you shall rule over it. What is sin's desire? We know that what the Bible says about sin, right? The wages of sin is death. And sin comes into our life and it shackles us and it rules over us. And so sin wants to control us. 
And that's why we have so many struggles is because of that sin. And so back to verse 16 of chapter 3, your desire shall be for your husband. There's just a desire to rule over your husband. Now, understanding that, that's where the battle starts. But that's the beginning of having freedom. Saying, Lord, I know that this heart of mine that doesn't want to submit is a result of sin in the world. And so I need your strength to get rid of that hardness and help me, Lord, to submit myself to my husband that I may be blessed by you, that we may be blessed as a family, that we may have peace within this family because we're following your word and your biblical principles in our lives. And God will help you in that. And so Peter... Again, says wives are to be submissive to their own husbands. Now, I have some quirky stuff. Um, just I have to throw it out there. There have been guys who have said, well, this is universal, that women need to be submissive to all men. I've heard that before, and that's not what it's saying at all. You might hear some guy come along. I mean, we had a couple of guys at our house that were staying there years ago, and we were talking about this, and the guy says, oh, I believe that um, that all women are to submit themselves to all men. So in other words, you walk in the room, there's men, you submit yourself to all of them. You know, that's not what it's talking about. The context here is an unbelieving husband, but to your husband. So don't, don't let that one fool you. He goes on that even if some do not obey the word, or, or in other words, that are unbelievers, <clears throat> and the word obey means that they're not persuaded. In fact, uh, Peter suggests that they are rebellious against the word. And some of your husbands might be rebellious against the word. They might be unbelievers. But when you submit, as he says, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. You have an opportunity to be a witness. And not by words. You don't even have to say a word. Just by the fact that, yes, honey, let's do that. You want to go there? Okay, honey, let's go there. Well, I'm thinking of buying this. Well, why would you do that? Well, here's our finances, all this. But if if you feel that that's what God is telling you, you go ahead, honey, and do it. See, the culture of Peter's time was this. That many women were married to Roman citizens and Gentiles and so forth. And the Gentiles had all kinds of gods. They had all kinds of idols. And the custom was that the women were to come into this family household. They were to marry this individual where they got married to them, they were to take on their gods. That was just the culture. So wh- whatever god your husband served, you now serve that god. Peter is saying, do not stop serving the true and living god. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to submit to your husband as long as it is not contrary to scriptures so that you can win them to Christ, to your god. See, that's the whole purpose. Statistically, it is harder for women to win their husbands to the Lord. You know why? Because they're not willing to submit themselves to that husband, to win him to the Lord. Statistically, it is easier for a woman to come to the Lord when the husband comes to the Lord first. They come alongside him. It's a lot easier. It is harder because of the submission problem. Now, if you have the love of Christ in you, and I think that you do, you want to see someone saved Yeah, your husband might be an alcoholic, he might be a drug addict, he might be all these things. But you want to see a soul saved. And so you pray and you seek the Lord and you submit and you trust and you have faith. And God can work that out. Now I have to say this. If your husband is abusive and if if he is abusive in in a real negative sense, then yeah, then there's grounds for separation and possibly for divorce. If there's adultery, then yeah, there's grounds for divorce in those areas, which you have the right to do. So, but saying that, Peter's point was, look, when you live with an unbelieving husband, submit them yourselves to them that hopefully they come to the Lord. He continues, verse 2, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. The word chaste means pure or separate. In other words, you love God. 
And you're not, you know, putting the notes in the sandwiches and you're not, you know, writing big old scriptures on the bulletin board and things like this. You just love God. It oozes out of you. People just know you love God. You know, you know people love God. You know, they're smiling. They're like, man, God loves me. God's on the throne. Everything's going to be okay compared to someone's like, what's wrong? Wait a minute. Why aren't you happy? You're going to heaven. Or, or someone that just loves God. You just know they love God because they're always talking about God. You know, they're always talking about Jesus. They're always talking about scriptures. They're always talking about what God has done in their lives and God, how God is changing them. What sinners that, that we are, that we fall short of God's glory. You know, and they're always talking about how negative they are and, and how wretched they are, but yet how much God loves them. You, know, you just know that. And then you know which ones aren't. There's no fruit. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. Right? You're going to know Christians by their fruit. There will be fruit there. And if there's no fruit, then there's a possibility that you don't know the Lord. You don't know the Lord. If you're not submitted unto God and there's no fruit, then you don't know the Lord. There's another reason why you're in church. Maybe because your husband believes and you just come along. Or maybe because your family. Or maybe because you think it's the right thing to do. But you don't have a personal relationship with God. They're to live pure before them, separated unto God, and not fearful. Verse 3, do not let your adornment be merely outward. Now, Peter's not saying don't adorn yourself, because some ladies look at this and like, well, see, I don't have to wear makeup, I don't have to dress myself up, you know, uh, that's not what he's talking about here. He's saying don't let your adornment be merely outward. In other words, don't focus on that. What they were doing was they were beautifying themselves, hoping that through sensuality, sexual desires, their husbands would come to say, boy, I really like her. I love her religion. You know, let me come to their faith and so forth. And Peter's saying, no, that's not how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit works this way. You know, he, he works this way. He convicts a person of their sins and then their need for a savior. And then they confess that Jesus is the Messiah. That he died on the cross and resurrected from the dead. And then they repent from their old life. And they want a new life. They want to live according to the word in repentance. And glorify God in everything. That's how a person is saved. If you miss any of those, then possibly you're not saved again. Peter's saying, don't adorn yourself to try to win them over. No, adorn yourself, but don't let that be the majority of the reason. Uh, McGee used to say, and quite often you hear quotes that if the barn needs painting, then paint the barn. You know, and he he <laughs> you read his commentary. He gets to the point where he's like, "There's some women that need a lot of paint." <laughs> he talks a little bit about his own wife and how how his wife uh, would adorn herself for him. And there's nothing wrong with that. Isn't it interesting that here? Here we, here we women, not including myself, here ladies adorn themselves because they're single and they want to get a man. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Come on, you put on a little makeup, you put on a nice dress, because you're trying to attract your husband that you think will be your husband. Isn't it interesting? And then once you get married, ladies, so those of you that are married, you realize, well, what do I have to do it for anymore? You know, I can stop now. You know, it's like I already got him. You know, so I don't need to put any makeup on. You know? <laughs> the guys go, it's true. Peter's saying, maintain that. Now, here, here's, here's the, the key, and i got to get this right. Spiritually speaking, Peter's saying, look, you don't have to adorn yourself. They'll come to the Lord. But once they come to the Lord, then adorn yourself to keep them. To keep them. And I think that's where we struggle, is that you have to keep your husband's. You know, once you have them, then keep them. You know, be pleasurable to them. They love you and they're geared that way um, towards sensuality and sexuality and so forth. And so you want to continue to keep them instead of falling in a place of complacency and then they're wandering around looking for other places. And that's where they fall short. Peter's saying, keep the adornment, but don't let that be the only thing. Arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Again, he's talking about that adornment. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. That's really the matter of the whole thing. Let it be the heart of that person. That heart that's pure. That heart that just loves God. 
That heart that just wants to serve, that understands that I'm willing to be selfless and put myself under you because you're the one in authority and you're the head of my home. You don't want to be the old nag. You know, say, shut up, old man. Tell me what to do. You know, I'm not going to listen to who made you God. No, be careful with that. Be careful because you're coming against God. God has established the authority. God has established the order. And you're coming along saying, God, you don't know what you're doing? Be careful with that. Again, that's evidence that you have rotten fruit. And you don't want to have rotten fruit. You want to agree with God. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because I love you. And if you have the wrong fruit, you don't know the Lord. And you're going to go to hell. You're going to die without Him. Because the heart, the heart is where the evidence and the fruit is at. You understand that? It's not about your position or taking anything away from you as a lady, as a woman at all. It's about you knowing God's heart and His purpose for your life. And the order. It's the hidden person of the heart. It's not even the outward. Even if you're submitting with the wrong attitude, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong because God wants the heart, that, that heart that's submitted unto the Lord. Notice what he says in the next statement, which is very precious in the sight of God. What's precious? You're submissive to your husband. That's precious. And, and we know Peter has used this word many times. Precious trials, precious blood, precious cornerstone, precious Lord, precious faith, precious promises. And now he says your submission is precious in the sight of God. All right, you want to know how to please God? Be submissive to your husbands. And God goes, how precious that is in my sight. That's the heart of God. And he's pleased by it. Now, he gives us an example. And again, as I said earlier, Abraham's a believer. And so it doesn't get you, there's not a loophole there. See, oh, this is only to unbelieving husbands. My husband's a believer now. I don't have to submit. No, he gives us an example of a believer, Abraham, and how Sarah submitted to him. Look at verse 5. For in this manner, in former times, that is in the Old Testament, the holy... Women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Now notice that Peter says those women that are submissive are holy. They're holy women because they know the Lord and they've separated themselves unto God's truth. And they did not, they also adorned themselves but also they were submissive. And so Sarah was a beautiful woman and Abraham loved Sarah, his wife. She was gorgeous. You go back to the Old Testament and you read about some of these ladies, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. These women were gorgeous. They were knocked out dead. You know, and, and these men loved them because they adorned themselves. They drew their husbands. But not only that, but they were holy women. They loved God with all their heart. They were willing to please Him. You know the story. <coughs> How Abraham had asked Sarah... To lie to the Pharaoh of Egypt, twice in fact, to lie. Because she was so beautiful, he was afraid that they would kill him and take her if they knew that um, she was his wife. And so he said, lie and say you're my sister, which was a half-truth because they were related on the other side there. But it's a half-truth. And you know what she did? She lied. She submitted Herself to her husband. Now, I don't understand that, ladies. I don't understand that. But he's telling me to lie. I don't understand that. But I'm just telling you what Scripture says. She submitted to her husband. And do you know God protected her? That's the important part, ladies. You might be saying, well, my husband does this. You don't know. And this doesn't apply because he's this. Peter never once said, if your husband's a good husband. He's telling you that these are idolatrous men who are wicked, who don't want anything to do with God. They're in rebellion. And he's saying, submit to him. That's what he's saying. Here's Abraham, a godly man, knows the Lord, directed by God. He's going to be the father of a great nation. And he's telling her to lie. And she submits herself. 
And so God says, because of your faithfulness, because you were willing to do this from your heart, I'll protect you. Not only did God protect her, I mean, there was one point where God literally spoke to Pharaoh and said, <clears throat> what are you doing? Like, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know that this was another man's wife. Oh, please, God, don't destroy me. I mean, God literally got involved. And then God blessed them because of Sarah. And not only did Pharaoh say, you need to go, but here, take some cattle, take some lambs, take, take whatever you want, gold and silver. And they were blessed because of the submissive of Sarah. See how God works and how God protects and how God blesses when we do those things? Why is the divorce rate in the Christian church so high? Why is it harder to get an unbelieving husband to come to the Lord than for a husband to get a wife? It's because we're not applying the biblical principles in our lives. It says, verse 6, And Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, I don't suggest that you walk around and, Yes, Lord. You know, I don't, that's not what it's saying here. Sarah called him Lord. That was the custom back then. And basically the word is curls, giving authority. And he's just basically saying, you're in, you're in authority position. And I understand that. So, hey, you make the call. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to trust in God. David uh, Guzik said, It is possible to obey someone without showing them the honor that is part of submission. True submission knows the place of both obedience and honor. Obedience and honor. We don't have that today. I, I, I notice that in marriages today. Um, they understand the principle of submission, but they don't understand the heart behind it. And so they don't honor their husbands. They don't really respect them. There's no respect for them. And in fact, we went to the conference yesterday, and we know this already, and you hear it all the time. It seems that our culture, Satan has grabbed a hold of it, and it tried to usurp women back up again and push men down. So every, every commercial you see, every movie you see, it's always about how stupid a man is, how they can't make great decisions. And so in your head, you're getting this constantly being brainwashed that your husband's stupid. He doesn't know what he's doing. You know, and so that's why you have to take charge and you have to make the decisions because he's too dumb. You see it on the commercials. How do you, how do you cook eggs? I don't know. Ha, 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 ha. He's so dumb. Women are now, and they're even pushing out, they become the heroes. They're now the action figures. They're the ones that are saving men in the world, you know, and so forth. That's, you know, that's not biblical. Totally unbiblical. And it's a lie of the enemy. Because he's trying to, again, usurp women's authority, just like in the garden, over men. And so where we go again, honey, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> really? God says we can't do that? I think we can do it. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. And then that's why we're in trouble. We need to get back to biblical principles. So if you honor your husband, then you are related to Sarah, whose daughters you are you are, if you do good, of course there's that disclaimer, if you do good. If you submit to your husbands, you honor them, then you're doing good, then you're also related to Sarah. You have the same heart and you have the same protection as God and are not afraid of any terror. In other words, you don't have to fear because God is in control of your life. God is in control of your life. He's going to protect you because he loves you that much. <clears throat> Let me close. This submission isn't a reward for the husband's good behavior. It's a command by God as the proper order for the home. It's what he's commanded. And as believing women, he desires that you be precious in his sight by obeying. Submission for Peter is a voluntary submission based on one's own recognition of God's order. Not our order. Not even my order. It's what God has established. It is a submission which is based on the death of pride on one hand and on the other, a desire to serve your husband. Someone said, don't be a woman that needs a man. Be a woman that a man needs. Let me say that again. Don't be a woman that needs a man. Be a woman that a man needs. That a man needs. A godly woman. And you'll attract the best husbands. 
Next week we'll see what kind of husband you should have. Because you'll be submitting to them if you don't choose the right husband. So you want to choose the right husbands. And usually, you know, I know the world says, well, you don't want to marry your father. But usually, you want to marry your father. Because your father loves you. Your father cares for you. You know, I tell my granddaughter, because I don't have any girls. And my, all my, my children were boys. And so they got to go out with, with their mom all the time. And so that's what they expected from their, their wives. Of course, how can you compete with perfection like that? It's, it's hard. <laughs> But with my granddaughters, see, I get the opportunity to, you know, in, in a sense, show them what their husbands are like. And so when I take them out, I hold their hand, I open their door, you know, I tell them I love them. And I, then I tell them, that's the kind of guy you want when you're 34, you know. And so, I, you know, you be that man that you want your daughters to be, to marry, you know, and that's what you look for. But we'll talk more about that next week. So let's pray.